السلام عليكم ورحمة الله. بسم الله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه. In the name of Allah, may the peace and blessings of Allah be upon His final messenger, Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, His companions and all those who follow Him until the day of judgment. First and foremost, I'm Alhamdulillah pleased and honored to be in this gathering. May Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala make it one that is filled with mercy, with His mercy, with His guidance and with His acceptance. And mashallah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless you know, all the panelists, you know, mashallah, that have been working hard and have been chosen by Allah you know, to do this work as the prophets were chosen by Allah from the many to do their work. So this is something that appreciation for the effort always has to be given where it is deserved. And inshallah, you also, in your own capabilities, can take part in this legacy of Prophet Muhammad to do the work. First of all, I was blessed to be born by, from a mother who was formerly a nun. And she decided, she had some questions that were unanswered. So she decided to leave the convent. She used to teach 50 students 50 girls in the convent, and I have some pictures of them, which really impressed me. Which the hijab, actually, the hijab that she was wearing is like the hijab that our sisters wear, with the same style, with the bottom white piece and the black outer piece. I was like, wow, you know. But alhamdulillah, my mom, even though she left the convent, it doesn't mean that she left religion as a whole, because she brought us up, waking up, saying our prayers, giving thanks to, for, to God for waking up, giving thanks to God before our meal, giving thanks to God before going to sleep, seeking protection from God, and, and, and you might know the rest. But being a Muslim, I mean being a youth in America, and having parents that Mashallah, make the efforts to struggle for their children, but sometimes make the mistake thinking that the only responsibility that they have is to work and provide the sustenance needed for these children. And I ended up spending that portion of the time that a lot of youth spend unsupervised, which is the after school to like seven, when the parents are working, that's when the drama takes place. It's not at night. That's when it begins. So when I was in high school, I used to, uh, I was kind of gifted with having the ability to freestyle in Spanish. So I used to do Spanish rap. Before it became popular here, just to make it clear. It was popular in, in Puerto Rico, but not here. And I used to sing in the clubs and so on. And being in, in school, when we used to have study hall, my friends used to do the beats and I used to freestyle. While other guys used to have to spend a lot of time writing a song. And it was, I had the ability to just freestyle. And being in, in high school, I got involved in, I got selected to play um, JV basketball and so on. And I always wanted my, my parents to come see the game. And because of their commitment, which at that time I didn't understand and youth do not understand. When they want you to show up, you should show up. You should take the day off and show up. Because when that didn't happen and even though I totally understand that my parents were working hard for us to give us, to spoil us, but I didn't understand at that time. So in order to avoid the thought, you know, looking and waiting to see the game start and my mom's not showing up, and I'm like, so then some of the drama began where, you know, when you're in need, sometimes you have people give you advice or suggest things that are harmful. So somebody said, you know what? 
before the game, why don't we drink, you know, some Bacardi Limon, and we'll be all right, and we'll, we'll play. I said, all right, so before every game, in the locker room, we used to drink and then play. So at that time, I was just not thinking about my parents didn't show up. So at first, it's just trying to escape the reality, not facing it. But you're a youth, and you need that support, and you need somebody to talk to. And the only one you have to talk to is friends who might have the same problems, or even worse. So being in, having a love for basketball during that time, Michael Jordan retired. I was upset. So I'm like, who's gonna be my favorite team now? So I'm like, all right, you know, I like, I like David Robinson, you know, he got, he, he's, he's disciplined and so on, and he's a, but then I'm like, in that time, we didn't have so many channels. In that time, you only got to see the, cha the, the basketball team of your locality. Or maybe, if you live in New Jersey, you see the Knicks, <laughs> right? So I was born, so I'm like, man, Nah, then I, I'm not gonna watch. Then I saw this player who actually changed his name. He became Muslim. His name was Chris Jackson and became Mahmoud Abdul Rauf. And I used to collect cards. So in one, in one of the cards, I read in the back the definition of his name. And it said that he became Muslim and he did pilgrimage and et cetera, et cetera. And sometimes, they used to catch him making wudu before the game and so on. So these things kind of caught my attention, but I wasn't interested in Islam. It was just, I came in contact with it. Also, you know, I said, I, I like the way he plays. So I began trying to mimic his game, you know, like shooting outside shots and so on. And I thought, uh, that's a little dis disappointing at the conference. Usually there's a late night basketball game where speakers go and vent you know, and sometimes school the young guys, but we didn't have that this year. So anyway, so Mahmoud Abdul Rauf was, um, I couldn't watch many of his games. So most of the information I got it from the, from the ESPN and so on. So then I said, you know what, I'm gonna pick the Knicks because I was born in New York so I'm gonna represent, right? So I picked the Knicks. That year, the Knicks went to the finals versus the Houston Rockets. And then I said, you know, so John Starks shot the three, got blocked, Knicks lost. Man, I used to hate hockey. But he was fasting during that time. So that caught my attention as well. So anyways, that was my first contact with Islam. But when I was in high school, I got involved in, in the gang life as well. I'm not gonna say the name of the gang, because it's a big gang. And maybe those people that didn't know me back in the days, they might, you know, out of ignorance, you know, take my life. And I have too much, you know, in my, in my plate right now to take care of, which is serving the Muslim youth and doing dawah, et cetera, that I don't wanna uh, put myself at risk. But when I was in this gang, I had a friend who had actually was a valedictorian, and, but he was raised in a shelter. So one time he needed a place to stay, and I told my mom, mom, you know, this guy is a good guy, man, he likes to read and so on, why don't you let him stay in my house? My mom said, all right. So he stayed in my house and he brought a box of books. And in this box of books, I saw the autobiography of Malcolm X. And I used to, I wasn't, I wasn't encouraged as a youth by my teachers to read or love reading. It was boring. So I didn't like it, but this time I was a little bit curious because I had the experience in school when I once had a dream 
And I told my teacher, my teacher told me, you're not going to make it. And I said, really? Straight up? I said, you're not going to make it. <laughs> and I swear, she only lasted one year in school. <laughs> Every day was hardship. Every day, yeah. I'm just being honest. You know. So when I was... When I was involved in this, with this brother, you know, this friend of mine, or this brother from the gang, we went to a library. And as we got the maximum amount of books that we could check out, we were walking out and we came across the Quran, right? And my friend said, oh man, I wanna read the Quran, but I, I can't check it out, I already checked out the books and so on. So he's like, I'm like, you know what, you want it? I'll take it, sorry. So right. I'll take it. So it wasn't a pocket Quran. Just let me make it clear. It's just I had some skills. So I end up taking the big Abdullah Yusuf Ali with the Arabic, English, and commentary. And I took it from the library. And then just for my friend, this because I was real, so I had to do it for him. You know, he wanted to read it. So then he left my house and he left the Quran. So the only thing Islamic in my house is the Quran. So then a year took place where two of my close friends from this group who were real, they got killed by same gang members. I was with them on a Sunday, and the next day I see them on the news. They got killed, and they got stepped on, on their faces. So I was like, you know, if, if these guys were real, and this happened to them, it could happen to me. So I said, so then I totally lost trust in the only people I used to trust, that I supposedly would have given my life for, that I sacrificed jobs and so on for them. And I said, if they did that to my friends, they could do it to me. So I said, nah. So then I'm like, I lost trust in all human beings. I mean, my parents, I trust them, but they didn't have the experience of the streets, so they couldn't get me out of it. So then I'm like, I'm looking, and Sometimes my friends used to do things that they didn't tell me. So I end up coming out of my house, all of a sudden get snatched up by the police. You robbed the house. I'm like, well, I just woke up. You know, the, you know, you dropped out, you're not in school. What time you wake up? If you're hanging out at night, you wake up like at 1, 2, 12, you know, right? So I'm like, I just woke up. I said, no, nah, get in the car. So it was like an everyday thing. My three thoughts were, am I going to die today? Am I going to catch a disease today? Or is my mother going to get hurt because of me, because of the label that I carry? And at that time, I, I, I was looking and I went to, I, I decided one day in the afternoon, that time I woke up early. So I decided to go to church. And I went to church and I'm like, you know what? I don't want to, I was asking God for guidance, you know? I used to bow down in my mom's room and I used to say, Ma, I say, God, you created me, and you know what I need better than myself. Choose for me the right way, and I will not look back. I'll leave everything behind. And at that time, I had a music contract. I had my 12 songs already written down, and I was going to record the album. And I was in that stage of making a choice. So I decided to look for guidance, and I remembered that I had the Quran. And I say, oh, I remember this Quran. You know, I'm just going to, I heard that this Quran has wisdom. And actually, the guy that recommended my friend this Quran is doing 35 years to life for killing those two friends that I had. So Allah used him to tell him that the Quran has wisdom, and I ended up with it. So as I'm reading the Quran, I come across. At a time when I was saying, who am I going to ask for help? I don't trust nobody. And then it said, you alone do we worship, and you alone do we ask for help. I said, that's what I'm going to do. I'm going to only worship God, and I'm only going to ask him for help. So then I continue reading the Quran, and I said, it said, Allah, and I said, I'm not used to saying Allah, I'm going to say God. So I could just continue reading. 
and I continued reading the Quran. Whenever I found the command, I began to do it. The Quran said, read the Quran in Fajr is witness. I will wake up when everybody in my house is sleeping. Quiet between me and God. And I used to read the Quran for a good hour, close the Quran, go to sleep, and feel like I accomplished something. Because it was, it was in secret between me and God. Then my parents wake up, everybody gets ready to go to work, and I already did something. They're just waking up. So I kept doing this for months. And then I read another ayah, Kutiba alaykum siyam, prescribed for you is fasting. So I began to fast, but I wasn't lucky as you. I didn't know about Maghrib. <laughs> All right? So I didn't know how to fast. So, and I'm, Omar, I'm sorry, man, I'm not trying to step. <laughs> I'm not a comedian either. Just, it's just natural, just, you know. But, Honestly, I began to fast until I felt pain because I said, I am not a hypocrite. I'm going to fast until I feel what the poor people feel. And when I feel that pain that I can't resist, then I will eat. Because I know my refrigerator is filled with food. So what's the point of fasting? So I did that. Then one about giving charity, a verse about giving charity. So I, I actually used to, I used to rock DKNY. And it, I decided one day to give away all my, like more than $3,000 worth of clothes, all DKNY, and I put in bags. And my mom was like, what, you, what are you doing? I said, I'm gonna give it in charity. She's like, what? I'm like, yeah. And I, I wasn't taking, no advice. I was just, the Quran said, give charity, sacrifice that which you love, and I was just like doing it. So I grabbed these bags and I went to the nearby shelter and I put it in front of the door and I, went, I was learning about doing things in secret between me and God. So I just rang the bell and I ran. And I used to know how to like, you know, run and, and, and hide and stuff like that. So I dipped, you know, into the dip, <laughs> right? So I dipped. And alhamdulillah, but, but the feeling that I got when I'm walking home, it was amazing, it was amazing. So after nine months of reading the Quran and practicing everything that I read in it with the commentary, I said to myself, I'm Muslim, you know, I got, you know, what, what, what is God gonna say? Why, why you didn't go to the mosque? Why? I'm like, I gotta go to the mosque. I chose to go to the mosque on a Friday and actually, Friday night, I chose to go to the mosque, and the mosque is in the same block that I used to hang out. So for sure, my friends were there. I'm like, man, these guys haven't seen me for a while. How am I gonna? And then I'm here, you know, I'm, this is nafs al lawama, the nafs that's in a battle with itself. And I'm like, you know what? Man, I gotta go. You know, Allah's gonna ask me on the day of judgment, why you didn't go? So I went. So then my friend came, and you know, when you're trying to, when you're trying to come clean, shaitan comes with the beer and with the blood, and he tries to convince you it's all right, right? So my friend came with a beer, and I said, you know what? I'm just going to fake it. I'm just going to hold it until I find out how to get in the mosque. And I'm here standing in front of the mosque, looking on top, and it has the word Allah, and I'm standing and I'm looking at it, and I'm like, man, how am I going to get in this place? Right? You know, I usually don't go, yeah, I used to sneak in parties, but not, you know, what are they going to say coming in with, you know, baggy pants, with, with, a, with a bandana or something like that? What are they going to say? You know, and I'm like, I, I don't want to get locked up. And so I'm like, then I saw a friend who I knew for eight years, who used to play basketball with me, who was Muslim, right? And he sometimes used to wear the kufi in high school. And his parents, you know, it was disciplined. He's passing by, and he knows me. And he knows that I used to have meetings in my house, <laughs> you know, like 50, 80 deep. And I said, man, I have to ask him. Allah's going to ask me why you didn't ask him. So I'm like, Muhammad. He comes back. 
He was going to the mosque. It was a Friday night picking up his, kids, his, his brothers and sisters from the Friday night school. So he comes back, and I said, listen, I want to go to the mosque. He said, you? I'm like, yeah. He's like, he's like why? I said, well, I spent nine months reading the Quran, and I believe in everything that's inside of me. And then I began breaking down to him and telling him, you know. And he was like, okay, but right now the imam is gone. Everything, you, you have to come on this day where there's like an imam that speaks English. So we, we made an agreement to come on Wednesday. So Wednesday came, and I'm here. I'm getting ready. I take a shower. I got dressed. And then it's almost 7 o'clock. And I'm like, wait a minute. We agreed 7 o'clock. We agreed Wednesday, but we didn't agree where we're going to meet. So I'm like, should I have, do I have to go to his house? Or is he going to come to my house? And I'm like, man, I have to go to his house. Allah is going to ask me, you know, if I don't go to his house, why you didn't go to his house? You really want to go to the mosque? Then you go to his house. So I go to his house. I'm like, man, his parents know me. So then I go, and I did similar to what I did in the shelter. So you have to go up long stairs. Yeah, Don said, we got stairs in, in Jersey, not, not in Boma. We don't have many stairs in Boma. But in Jersey, we have stairs. So I go up these long stairs, and I ring the bell, and I ran down. And then the mother comes out. And she's like, come, come in, come in, come in. She already knew. So I go in. The, the first time I go in the Muslim house, and I see the ayahs of the Quran and so on. So I went to the masjid that day, and I met the imam. And the imam asked me, so... Uh, how do you learn about the Quran? Where do you get the Quran? And I said, uh, I was blunt. I stole it. He said, what? <laughs> I said, I swear, I never seen any man run so fast. <laughs> he said, you got to give it back. I said, I'll give it back unless I get the same copy. He said, this was my only friend. You think I'm going to give it back? This is the one that helped me get rid of my addiction to alcohol. This is the one that helped me learn how to be patient when I didn't have patience. This is the one that only gave me good advice. Think I'm going to give it back? Give me the same copy, and I'll give it back. And if I don't get the same copy, then I'll buy this one. So then he ran in the library, and he says, is this one, this one, this one? I said, yeah, it's this one. And then he gave me the same copy. So alhamdulillah, in the process of learning about Islam and going to the mosque, I began going home in the morning after Fajr. And I used to find my mom in the kitchen. And I, in finding my mom in the kitchen, I used to read the Quran there. And sometimes I would find something interesting about Jesus and Mary. And I said, Mom, can I share with you something? And she was like, OK. So I began reading to her the Quran. And it became a daily thing. Every day after Fajr, in English, I would just read to her the Quran. Then, alhamdulillah, I got married. And my mom comes to me one day, and she's like, you know, I miss your reading of the Quran. And I was like, really? She's like, yeah. And a lot of the questions that I had that made me leave the convent were answered. With your, through your reading of the Quran. And I was like, so you believe in what you heard? She's like, yeah, and I want to be Muslim. So then, alhamdulillah, my mom became Muslim two years after me. And then she faced some hardship, though, because she went to the mosque, and somebody told her, you know, if you accept Islam, you have to divorce your husband. So my mom was like, man, I've been married for 30 years. 30 years to a good man who never raised his hand at me, never cursed at me, was committed, worked hard, used to come home in his, in his, in his, used to be home in his day off and clean the bathrooms and without me asking him, used to help around the house, used to cook. And this is sometimes rare in similar societies. So she said, no. So she, she, it made her stop. That, that time I was in Hajj. I was from Union City to Hajj, not Hollywood to Hajj. <laughs> I was from Union City, yeah, so I was in Hajj, and I came back, my mom didn't accept Islam. So then I told her, Mom, save yourself from the hellfire. If you believe in this, in that there's only one God, 
just return to your nature that there's only one God and that Muhammad is the final messenger and that Jesus was a messenger and that Moses was a messenger. And then we try with my dad. So she said, okay. So she accepted Islam. Four months later, in a convention like this, with Imam Siraj, Imam Zaid Shakir, Zaid, uh, uh, yeah, Zaid Shakir, and others, my dad, alhamdulillah, accepted Islam. So would my dad accept Islam if my mom would have divorced him? You know the answer I'm not going to say. But <laughs> alhamdulillah, a year later, my brother accepted Islam, my older brother accepted Islam, and I was blessed with um, the desire to seek knowledge, to be able to teach, alhamdulillah. So I was blessed. One time, I wanted to seek knowledge, and I left my job, and I started coming to conventions. And I came to a convention like this, the Ikna Mass Convention. And I was running around and looking for, for people to talk to and ask them. And I want to just, just hoping for an opportunity to meet somebody that can open the door so I can go overseas and seek knowledge. So alhamdulillah, I decided to go to Egypt. And I was blessed with the ability to, with, with the opportunity to go. And when I went to Egypt, I met Brother Mujahid. Alhamdulillah, I didn't know I was going to meet a Hispanic there. And subhanAllah, we were celebrating Eid, and it was all Hispanic. <laughs> we had, we, I, I swear, we, 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 we killed the sheep, and, we, and, and, and we, we didn't pay for it, man. We, I mean, we got it as a gift, but we didn't pay for the work. We, we cut the neck, and we peeled it, and we cooked it up. And we were, my kids first were walking it, and then they were eating it. And it was like, it tastes good. First they were sad, but they were extremely <laughs> happy. They were extremely happy with the aftermath, alhamdulillah. So, you know, it was, it was, it was a, a blessing to, to be in Egypt and learn about Islam and meet wonderful people. Me, Brother Mujahid, and, you know, alhamdulillah, Imam Suhaib, and others. And alhamdulillah, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to utilize us for his sake. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because when we accept Islam, Islam is not a hobby. Islam is our life. It's 24 hours a day, nothing else than submitting to God's will. And whoever Allah loves, yashrah sadrahu lil Islam, which is he opens up his, his heart and the person embraces Islam, submits to Allah. So this is from Allah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala continue to preserve us in his way.